thank you, God, for another wonderful opportunity we have to gather in your name. Lord, to honor you, to praise you, and to worship you, Lord. Lord, I want to ask that you open our hearts and that you enlighten our minds so that we can take in your word and apply it in our lives as we, as we go into our weeks. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this morning, I want to talk about a subject that is very simple and easy to understand, but at the same time is very complex and difficult to grasp. I want to talk about the sovereignty of God. This basically means that I want to talk about God's supreme power and His supreme authority. Or, to put it another way, I want to talk about God's omnipotence, His omniscience, and His omnipresence. I want to talk about the fact that God is all-powerful, that He's all-knowing, that He's outside time, He's responsible for the creation of everything, and He is in total control of His creation. That's what I want to talk about. We can either, we can do it in two ways. We can either do it in a, in a classroom setting, you know, we take a blackboard, we write a few ideas, we define them, and then we get very bored and very confused in a matter of five minutes. Or we can talk about it in stories. So this morning I want to share with you two or three biblical stories that have much to say about God being sovereign and in total control of all events. Please listen. I want you to realize from the start that God's sovereignty wasn't just involved in the biblical events. God is also sovereign and in complete control when it comes to your situations, when it comes to your challenges, which you are facing on a daily basis. Okay. Now the first story I want to share with you concerns the Exodus and how God was actively and clearly showing that He was guiding the lives and situations of His people. But before we can talk about the actual Exodus, we need some background context. Now, in Genesis 3, verses 15, God made the following promise. He said, I will put enmity or hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is the very first messianic prophecy, meaning that it's the very first prophecy concerning Christ who was to come and conquer over sin and evil. Why did God make this promise to the devil? Why did God tell Satan that the seed of the woman, Christ, will destroy him because of Satan's rebellion against God and because of the role Satan played in influencing Adam and Eve to rebel against God and cause God's perfect creation to fall into a state of sinfulness. Now, when we look at Genesis chapter 12, we can really see that God's plan of salvation really is in full effect. What do I mean by this? If we read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, we read the following. It says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, in this passage, we find God choosing a man from Chaldea, Abraham, through which he, 
God was going to conquer sin and evil. God promised this man, Abraham, that he will become a great nation, that he will be blessed and have a great name, and that he will be a blessing to others. Now, in Genesis chapter 15, we read for a second time about God's promise to Abraham that he will become a great nation and that he will be blessed and have a great name. But here, this very interesting prophecy in Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 up until 16. It says, Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back uh, um, here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Please remember this. This is going to be quite important now. now. In Genesis chapter 17, we again read about God promising Abraham that he will become a great nation, that he will be blessed and have a great name, and that he will be a blessing to others. Now, in Genesis chapter 16 and 21, we read about Abraham fathering two sons, Ishmael, which was the firstborn, and Isaac. And it was Isaac who inherited the covenant promises God made to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 26, we read about Isaac fathering two sons, Esau, the firstborn, and Jacob. And once again, it was Jacob, the secondborn, who received the covenant promises which God made to his grandfather Abraham and to his father Isaac. In Genesis chapter 29 and in chapter 30, we read about Jacob fathering 12 sons, with Joseph being his favorite of them all. This resulted in the rest of Jacob's sons to become jealous of Joseph, and this jealousy reached its climax in Genesis chapter 37 and resulted in Joseph being sold as a servant to traders who ultimately took him to Egypt. Now, God blessed Joseph while he was in Egypt. He blessed him immensely. He took him from being in a position of servanthood, he was a servant, to becoming a prisoner, and God ultimately took him to become the second most powerful man in Egypt. Okay, We read this in chapter 41. Now as we read the last 10 chapters of Genesis, we read about how God used Joseph to prepare for the famine that was to devastate Egypt and Canaan. This famine resulted in Jacob sending his sons to go and buy food in Egypt. This famine resulted in Joseph reuniting and reconciling with his brothers. And this famine resulted in Jacob's family moving to Egypt. This is the official start of the fulfillment of God's prophecy to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 verses 13 up until 16. Also, please hear this remarkable statement by Joseph in chapter, uh, Genesis 50 verses 20. He says, As for you, this is now Joseph uh, 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 speaking to his brothers, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Church, do you see God's sovereign hand in this background information that I just gave you? Many, many, many things happened from the moment God called Abraham to the event where Israel 
settled in Egypt. Please hear me. God was in total control of everything that happened. From the events of Abraham to the events of Joseph. Now, let's skip approximately 400 years. The prophecy about Abraham's family living as slaves and an oppressed people has finally been fulfilled. After the death of Joseph and the Egyptian rulers who looked favorably on the Hebrew people, things changed and the Hebrew people were utilized as slave labor. But it was time for God to keep his promise, his covenant promise to Abraham and take the people of Israel to their promised land. It was time for God to judge the Egyptians, the nation that oppressed the Hebrews. It was time for God to judge the Amorites, the inhabitants of Canaan, because their iniquity has also reached its climax. The first few chapters of Exodus paints a very bleak picture. The Egyptians were intimidated by the ever-growing population of the Hebrew people. The Egyptians feared an uprising, and this resulted in the order to murder every male Hebrew baby that was to be born. But this slaughtering of the Hebrew baby boys provided God with the opportunity to place a certain Hebrew baby with the name of Moses in the care of Egyptian royalty. Why? To educate him in reading writing, to educate him in history, to educate him in the Egyptian religious system. Why? Because God prepared him for a very, very difficult task that laid ahead. After approximately four decades or 40 years, Moses accidentally killed an Egyptian god who was beating an uh, Israelite slave. And this resulted in Moses fleeing Egypt. Now, during the period of Moses, uh, uh, when Moses was hiding from the Egyptians, please hear what Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 says. It says, During those days, uh, those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Now, it's around this time in Exodus chapter 3 when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, calling Moses to lead the Hebrew people out of Egypt and to the covenant land, Canaan. God made it very clear that he was the one who, active, who was actively responsible for the events concerning the Exodus. God's presence and his activity can almost be experienced with our senses. Just imagine you were there those days. I mean, you, you could see the hail falling when we talk about the plagues now, that's not a normal rainstorm. Though. The total darkness, the, the Nile becoming blood. I mean, that is, you can really, you can see it, you can hear it, you can taste it, you, you touch it. God was there. He was actively involved. He could experience it. It was very plain that God was fulfilling his covenant promises. So, because God knew that Pharaoh would totally reject uh, or object against letting the Hebrew people go, God sent Moses with the judgment of the ten plagues, not only to judge the Egyptians, but also to bring glory to his own name as the unique creator of heaven and earth. Now, I quickly want to tell you something very interesting about the ten plagues. Who of you knows that God never does something randomly. He's not a random God. He's got a... He, he,
Okay, so I said that God knew Pharaoh would be totally against letting the Hebrew people go, and God sent Moses to judge the Egyptians with the ten plagues. He did not only judge the Egyptians, but he was also bringing glory to his own name. Now, like I said, God never does something randomly. He has a reason for everything he does, even when smashing the Egyptians with the plagues. God not only judged the Egyptians, but he also judged the different Egyptian deities or the different Egyptian gods. For example, when God turned the Nile into blood, he made life extremely difficult on a physical sense or in a physical sense for the Egyptians, but he was also showing the Egyptians that their gods were utterly useless and dead. For instance, when God cursed the Nile, he demonstrated that three specific uh, Egyptian gods, the god of the Nile, the goddess of the Nile, and the guardian of the Nile, were utterly useless to stand up against the almighty creator of heaven and earth. Or, when God sent those large hailstones, he physically judged the Egyptians, but he was also showing that the sky goddess, the god of fertility and crops, and the god of storms were worthless to stand up against the Holy One. So, when we read Exodus chapter 7 up until 15, we find God judging Egypt with ten supernatural plagues, and we read about the miraculous Red Sea crossing, an event that absolutely blows the mind. And this finally resulted in the Israelites leaving the Egyptian oppression. Now, we can carry on talking about God um, who supernaturally provided food and water for the Israelites in the desert. We can talk about how God physically met Israel on Mount Sinai in a flame and communicated with them in a voice that absolutely terrified them. We can talk about how God gave Israel the Ten Commandments and the tabernacle and dwelt with them and was in their midst. And we can talk about how God provided for the Israelites in various supernatural ways throughout their 40-year wandering in the wilderness. But I think you get the point. Church, can you see the hand of the sovereign God working throughout the stories I've told you so far? Just as God, the sovereign one, was in control of the events concerning Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Jacob's family which moved to Egypt, so is he in control of the prophecies and the promises he has made concerning your life. Just as the sovereign God was in control concerning the Israelites as they went through hell in their oppression and slavery, so is he in control of every single challenge you will face in your lifetime. I need you to grasp this concept this morning and to understand it. God is in control when it comes to your pains and when it comes to your pleasures. He's in control when it comes to your freedoms and when it comes to your persecutions. He is in control. I chose to use this example of the Exodus uh, um, where God is seen and experienced as he guided his people. Because there will also be times when you can really feel and really experience God working in your life. And that's great. But what about those situations when it seems that God is absolutely nowhere to be found and is as quiet as the dead? Where is our sovereign God when we face our numerous challenges, but he just seems to be nowhere near or in control for that matter? Luckily, we are answered by the events described in the book of Esther. Who has read the book of Esther, by the way? Let me give you a brief summary of the story as, uh, as, yeah, as found in the book of Esther. In chapter 1, we read about the Persian king, 
Xerxes, who hosted a great party. But his wife, the queen of Persia, disrespected Xerxes and refused to attend this party. This resulted in the queen being banned from entering the king's presence and the search for a new bride and queen began. In chapter 2 we read of a young Jewish lady named Esther who was compelled to participate in a contest to select a new queen. She was raised by a man with the name of Mordecai after the death of her parents. Now we're not sure whether he was her uncle or her cousin. All we know he was her guardian. Now Esther went on to win this contest, if you want to call it like that. Um, she was chosen to be the new queen. But King Xerxes did not know that she was actually a Jew. We also read about Mordecai, the guardian of Esther, who learned of a plot to kill King Xerxes. Mordecai then went and he told Queen Esther about this plot. And Queen Esther went on to tell the authorities about this plot to kill the king. And this resulted in the men involved in this plot to be hanged. In chapter 3, we read about a guy named Haman, one of King Xerxes' high officials in his government. He was a very proud man. Not a nice, not a nice guy. Not nice at all. He demanded the respect and the obedience of those who were under him. Mordecai, Esther's guardian, refused to bow to Haman. And this absolutely infuriated the guy. Now Haman, who was an Amalekite, knew that Mordecai was a Jew. And if you know anything about the history of the Amalekites and the Jews, you will know that there's been bad blood between them from the days of the Exodus, which happened about a thousand years before the events of Esther. So they don't like each other and they're not going to get over it. Haman actually went and he convinced Xerxes to pass a law calling for the destruction of the Jewish people. But neither Haman nor Xerxes knew that Queen Esther was also going to be affected by this law. In chapter 4, we read that Mordecai and the Jews began to mourn and they fasted because of this coming genocide. Mordecai then went to Esther and he asked her to plead with the king, King Xerxes, to spare the Jewish people. Esther was at first not very keen to go into the presence of the king without an appointment. Believe it or not, people were actually killed for entering the presence of the king without an appointment. But in chapter 5, we read that Esther worked up enough courage to and she approached the king who thankfully accepted her into his presence and asked her what her request was. Esther then invited King Xerxes and Haman the Amalekite for a meal at her house or at her home. I'm not sure. Esther also told King Xerxes that she will tell him her request when they come to her house for the meal. Now, when Xerxes and Haman arrive at Esther's house to enjoy the meal, Esther requested that they do the same the next day. Okay. And this resulted in Haman the Amalekite to absolutely swell in his pride. I mean, it's the second time that the queen of Persia is going to invite me for a meal. I mean, that is, that is, that is the, oh, he's very important guy. Now we also read about Haman who once again met Mordecai in the streets. And again, Mordecai refused to bow to Haman. Haman could not contain his fury. He could not wait for the date, according to that decree to murder the Jews, to kill Mordecai. 
And this resulted in Haman building special gallows so that he can hang Mordecai the next day. Now in chapter 6, we read that King Xerxes could not sleep that very same night that Haman was busy building his gallows. And he requested that someone read to him about the recent events that happened in his kingdom. It just so happens that the story of Mordecai, who stopped the plot you know, to kill the king, which we talked about in chapter 2, um, that story was read to, him, uh, to King Xerxes that night. And King Xerxes suddenly realized that he never publicly thanked Mordecai for saving his life. That same night, Haman visited King Xerxes to get permission to hang Mordecai the next day. But before Haman could get permission to murder Mordecai, King Xerxes asked Haman for a bit of advice. King Xerxes asked Haman how a king should reward a man he wanted to honor. Now, this is very ironic. Haman, pretty foolishly, thought that King Xerxes wanted to honor him. So he told Xerxes that the person being honored must ride the king's horse while wearing the king's robe and the king's crown. Now, just imagine the look on Haman's face when King Xerxes told Haman to make arrangements for Mordecai to be honored in the way Haman proposed. But Haman's week was only going from bad to worse. In chapter 7, we read that King Xerxes and Haman returned to Esther's house for the second meal. It was then when Esther told King Xerxes that her people were to be killed and destroyed. Xerxes was furious. And he wanted to know who was responsible for such a decree. And Esther told the king that Haman is the one responsible. Now, Haman, ironically enough, was hanged on the very same gallows that he built for the purpose to murder Mordecai. Now, the story goes on. The Jews were spared and so forth. They actually murdered a bunch of other people that wanted to murder them. The Feast of Purim was born there. But I, I think you get the point once again. So how does this story differ from the story concerning the Exodus? The deliverance experienced by the Jews in the book of Esther is very different from the deliverance experienced by the Jews during the Exodus. There are no signs, there's no wonders. There are no special revelations. There are no major prophets like Moses. And believe it or not, and you can go check this for yourself, no one even mentions God in the whole book, in all ten chapters. There's not one reference made to God. Yet, the story is told in, in a way that makes it abundantly clear that God, even when he's most hidden, is still very much in control. He's very present and he's working to protect and deliver his children. Church, I want to give you a comforting assurance that God is near, that God is in control, that he's absolutely sovereign, even in situations and in circumstances where he feels one million miles away. Church, it's a very basic message, but it's also very difficult to understand once you go into the deeper things. But I want you to realize God is in control. In your good days, in your bad days. He's, he knew the end from the beginning. He's the sovereign one. He is in control. Now, I told Pastor Rudy yesterday, that if you study the history of the origins of the Bible, you know, how we got the Bible put together, you cannot help 
but see the same thing, God's hand being in control. You know, if I can just summarize it quickly. God, when he first gave the scriptures to the Israelites, he gave it in a very unique language, which was very unique to those people, the Israelites. Okay, why? It was to keep that nation pure and clean so that the Messiah could come through that race. Once that happened, God has already prepared the whole known world with what we call Kine or Koine Greek, which means common Greek. Okay, Everybody could speak it. So God had a way to put that word, the word of God, onto paper for everyone to understand. Once we had the Messiah, we got the word. Once we got the word, we had the Roman Empire now in charge, which was absolutely amazing in infrastructure and engineering. They provided roads for the gospel to be spread. You can't help but see God working. You know, I need to tie this in with communion this morning. And once again, Christ was not caught of God when he was crucified. That is exactly why he came. If you want to know how, inc you know, the, the extent, the great extent, you know, I don't even know how to properly explain to you or describe to you how perfect and sovereign God really is. He's the one who grew the tree on which they nailed him. He's the one who guided and who protected from infancy the same people who crucified him. He came here for one purpose, and that was to be nailed on the cross for you, for me, to conquer evil and to conquer sin. Pastor Rudy, can I ask for your help? That I can just talk and then go away so that you can come here. <laughs> when we read Matthew 26, starting from ah yeah, uh, yeah starting from 26 26 we read about Christ during the last supper breaking the bread and pouring the wine in a cup you know and I, I really want you this morning as you I can't see Pastor Rudy now did he break bread okay okay <laughs> I want you to take your bread this morning and as you eat flesh of Christ, symbolized by the bread, really think back to that moment 2,000 years ago. Think about the dust. Feel it on your feet. Smell the smells. Feel the heat. Hear the shouting of people being executed. That is your Lord and your Savior being ripped apart for you. And as you partake in the wine, think about the blood of Christ who's now locking you into a new covenant with him. It is a covenant. You, it's an eternal covenant with him. It is a covenant where you become a child of God. It is such a privilege to partake in the communion. Amen. While this music is playing softly, I just want us to just to stand quickly and we can end off with prayer. Just to stand in this presence. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this table, Lord. Lord, thank you that we can just come to your table and bow it down before you, Father, just to know, Lord, like, like Andre explained, Father, that that we can just smell, Father, and feel the emotions that day that you had to go through. Just to be in that atmosphere. Father, it must, must have been just so, so sad. But, Father, in that sadness and in that hurt and all that, all those pain, Father, came deliverance for us. And Lord, we are so grateful. We are so thankful for what you have done. Father, because without you, we, we would have been lost. We would have been sheep wandering in the wilderness, not knowing where to go, where to turn to. And the enemy will just pick us off and devour us, Lord. But you stick beside us, Father. 
Lord, we are your children. We are your sheep, Father. And we are so grateful that you are keeping your eye over us. Because we know and we have heard in confirmation this morning that you are in control. No matter what, no matter how, no matter when, Father, your hand is in control. For then at the end line, you are sitting there waiting for us. You're waiting for us with a smile. Lord, it all depends on how we are going to make our decisions. Are we going to decide to walk towards you or away from you? But Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you that we can just know that you are in control. You are the foundation. You are the start and the finish. Father, no, no matter where we go, you will be there with us. Lord, I ask while we are standing here, Lord, I just want to pray for this congregation, for this English service, Father. You will bless them, Father. That the Holy Spirit will fill them. Lord, that their spirits will be filled with living water, Father. Father, they will know and realize and mend it in their hearts that you are in control. No matter how chaotic their lives might be, no matter how many chaos and lies and negativity might be spread into their lives, Father. We come and we cancel that in the name of Jesus Christ, Father. And we know... Lord, and we heard this morning, no matter what circumstances we are going through, what character building we are going through, Father, you are in control. And you are molding us with your precious, pure, wonderful hands. Lord, I ask that you will bless this, this congregation with wisdom, Father, and with the godly action, Father. They won't just be stuck in their seats, but they will go out and minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've, like Andrew said, Father, you put some people so some races in charge so that they can be roads built and stuff be done and social media and all those things father so that we can have it easier into spreading your gospel and lord so that we can take that on to us so that we can make the time and effort to use to use it father to spread your word there's no more excuses no more ways to run away no more excuses to think out Lord, you are in control. The ball is in our court, Father. Father, we are going to use it for your, for your heavenly works, Father. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you are doing. And Lord, may you bless this church, Father, with health, Father. You will keep them safe. And when they go out of this church, that they will live according to your word in Matthew 28, Father. And make disciples. And we will be a light for the dark world outside. Thank you, Jesus. Praise all only your wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Church, we can all go enjoy some nice cup of coffee or tea.